Thank you for tuning in to Planet of the Courageous. It is said in the Tibetan view that we pick this planet to learn how to be courageous, which means having the heart to face our fears and our pain. Now for many of us, the fear we need to face is the one cultivated, created, and rehearsed in our minds. As one friend said, we need the courage to listen to all the screaming in our heads. The classic way to face this fear of mind is to sit down and make friends with the noise. This is called mindfulness meditation, being present with what is, and it's quite a courageous act. Today I have a gentleman who leads people in the act of making friends with their mind. He is a Zen teacher at Diamonds, Diamond Sangha, a jewel of sanity in Palolo Valley here in Honolulu. This center was started by pioneers of the ancient Zen practices of Japan, Robert Aiken Roshi and his wife, Anne. Aiken Roshi was a graduate of University of Hawaii in 1947 and contributed to the establishment of Buddhism in the West. Aiken Roshi died in 2010, and Michael Kieran is now the senior teacher at the Diamond Sangha Retreat Center. Thank you for joining us, Michael. Glad to be here, Dean. I, I'm so excited about this conversation. You said it could go on for hours, so you chat on the way down. But there is something I wanted to share with you. I didn't know if you knew this. Did you know that I am the fastest draw in the West? <laughs> this is where you say, Bang! This is where you say, no, Dean, I didn't know that. <laughs> Can I show you? Please. Okay, it's going to take me a moment because it's, it's kind of a Zen moment. Okay, ready? It just takes me a little preparation here. Okay. That was it. Do you want to see it again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I'm with you. I had to do it. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Let's start with Tonby, the French historian, who, who is said to have said that the coming of Buddhism to the West will be one of the major historical factors of, in the 20th century. A lot has happened in our century, uh, the last century. We have wars, we have the internet. But what do you think of that comment altogether and how you've seen Buddhism help and you could say infiltrate and benefit our culture? It's a wonderful question. Um, I think it's too soon to tell. Uh -huh. uh, China was in, uh, I, I'm sorry, Buddhism was in China for three, four hundred years before um, really um, indigenous forms uh, started to appear. Uh -huh. But um, from this vantage point, um, Obviously, mindfulness is widespread. Um, you talked right. about that in your introduction. Right. Um, I don't think... That word. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. the word, um, which means many things in different contexts, uh, that people are starting to pay attention to what they're thinking when they're thinking mm -hmm. and actually recognize that they're thinking uh -huh. um, and that they're feeling something when they're feeling uh, has to be a good thing. Uh, and much yeah. better than just acting out right. with, with no awareness, no and, awareness. and assuming right. mm -hmm. that their thoughts are happening somewhere else than just in their head. Mm -hmm. um, that gets us all into a lot of trouble. So as, as people can become more aware of that, it's, it's a good thing. Uh, in terms of the tradition I come from, Zen Buddhism, mm -hmm. um, it doesn't go nearly far enough. But by it's that a start. You mean, yeah, by that you mean the mindfulness, tech, mindfulness technique. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a tool in Buddhism. It isn't the end of Buddhism. It's a, at least that's how my understanding of it. It's a profound and wonderful tool of Buddhism to start to get you reflecting on how you're creating your own world or, in fact, uh, uh, <clears throat> how you're kind of getting led around, just not sure who's in charge of what if you start to really look at your mind, like how much prattle are you listening to? Mm -hmm. And that ha just that sense of self-reflection that you're talking about is amazing. But that's what you're also saying. It isn't really the be-all and end-all of what Buddha spoke about. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. So as far as it goes, it's, it's, it's good. Uh -huh. um, and it can be used Wonderful. in lots of contexts, mm -hmm. which may or may not be good. but. Um, well, what would do the what wouldn't be good there? What's well, what's your what's your hesitation? A, in a the, classic example for for Zen Buddhists is the um, the way uh, soldiers were trained in Japan mm -hmm. um, to just not kill. feel, not think, yeah, mm -hmm. and execute the order. 
Mm -hmm. um, maybe our soldiers are trained much the same way. Um, maybe well, in fact, it is a part of the Army's basic training now, yeah. mindfulness. So there, in that, I've been in discussion with pretty high up officers wondering, one person called it the Trojan horse, meaning it could change the military itself. So they're looking at it not just in terms of presence, but also in terms of opening it up an awakefulness. Our soldiers are now being asked to be ambassadors in all honesty. Yeah. So, but that's a whole different subject. Uh, let me go back to something that okay. I'd like to talk about. That, I, not that anything's off the table right. at all. But each of these could, uh, oh, each of these could be. <laughs> go on and on. Yeah. Wherever Buddhism has, you could say, um, I'm trying to find another word, infiltrated or influenced or come into another culture, it has both influenced that culture and been influenced by that culture. Yes. Buddhism started in India, actually Nepal now, goes to China and it meets Confucianism and Taoism. It gets changed, gets mixed up, a little thing comes out of it. Dogen goes to Japan, first first patriarch, not first patriarch. Dogen goes from Japan to China, China. and comes back. Yeah. Right, and comes back. <clears throat> and in Japan meets Shintoism and, and the local deities and the local culture there and it influences it. Now Buddhism comes to the West, and I think we're back to Tondi again. What influences do you see happening in America right now? And I, I, I granted, yeah, three, we're, granted not in, it's early. we're not into a three to four. <laughs> and on the other hand, we both are sitting, uh, that's a kind of a pun, we're both sitting on 40 years of, uh, of looking at this thing. So what, how do you think it's going to be influenced by Christianity, by American values, and consequently, yeah. each one will leave its mark? I think two of the most significant uh, ways that Buddhism is being changed in the West is what, what might be called the laicization of Buddhism, that it's becoming, uh, the Buddhism that comes to us was uh, a male monastic tradition. Yeah, basically. And yeah. Um, it's not to say there weren't uh, enlightened lay people and women. There are many, and they were wonderful teachers. But the primary tradition that comes down to us and has been recorded is that of men that were uh, practicing together. As this tradition has entered our culture, um, it's become a practice of lay people. And in my particular tradition, it's being taught by lay people mm -hmm. rather than ordained priests, mm -hmm. uh, professionals, in, in, as it were. Right. And I think that's a really important change. Huge. Uh, Huge change. Yeah. Along mm -hmm. with that comes mm -hmm. a concern for the world. What happens in our world? Mm -hmm. What happens to the planet? Mm -hmm. What happens... Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, to, to education, mm -hmm. what happens to women, how are women treated. Mm -hmm. um, all of those questions are become part of the purview of our practice and not somehow outside of it. Right, right. Uh, yeah, it, it really can't be emphasized almost how new of a um, experiment it is to have a lay tradition. Fundamentally, Buddhism has been a monastic tradition. And I know when uh, Trimpa Rinpoche talked about that, he said, "Householder yogi." He says, "You know, you've got to, you're going to be the first people culture to try to make this work." And one of the things that you mentioned, I think, is for sure going to mark Buddhism, which is uh, feminism. Just that we're w waking up to the the beauty of the feminine, and that it just isn't appropriate anymore to have a patriarchal uh, gig Indeed. going on. Yeah, just, we miss too much. We miss too much, you know. And so there's one thing that you say would would mark it. And I, I would, we've talked about this, you and I, on occasion. Psychology is both going to leave a mark and be marked by Buddhism. I had a friend who says, you can't, you can't turn around without a, a course on mindfulness in psychology. Anymore. Yes. So speak about that, too, about the psychologic, psychological influence. Uh, yes. Because it's um, certainly a religion of our time. You it is say. indeed. Yeah. And um, from the earliest days with D.T. Suzuki, these things have been uh -huh. meshed together um, in ways that I think have certainly benefited psychology. Mm -hmm. um, it's given a language for Western people to talk about part of of Zen training or Buddhist training and what mm -hmm. happens. Mm -hmm. Of course, Buddhism has its own very rich uh, vocabulary and, yes. uh, for psychology. Mm -hmm. um, 
but I think maybe um, to the uh, detriment of other, other qualities. I'll give you an example. Um, one of the um, well-known uh, teachings of, of, our, of our way is to take one's attention and turn it around on itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, when, you, when many of the current translators have translated that into English, they say, turn the light within. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't say that. Mm -hmm. It just says, turn it back on itself. In other words, you're, you're looking at the mind that is thinking. You're looking at what thinks. Yeah, you're looking at the mind or the awareness that thought is contained in. Yes. Yeah, which is a whole different thing than turn the light within. Right. Uh -huh. So part of what I find uh -huh. happening um, with a lot of the people that I meet that are coming to our practice, um, they think that, that this practice is one of observing. Right, 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 right. So right. they sit and watch their thoughts I know, or watch their feelings. For years. You can do that for decades. Yeah. Right. And um, mm -hmm. it's what the old Zen teachers used to call nothing happens Zen. Yeah. yeah. Of course, nothing happens anyway, <laughs> but um, <laughs> uh, in the best of ways. In uh, the best of ways. In the uh, freshest of ways. Yes. Nothing happens. <laughs> yeah. But we don't get to that point by just observing. And, and furthermore, it... Mm. it continues and perpetuates a kind of divided life. Yeah, there's still um, a duality going on there, yeah. me watching something. Yeah, yeah, I know that, that whole watcher thing of the mindfulness movement is, is just, quite frankly, a bit disturbing to, to think that that's where it's going to get arrested, this uh, inquiry into the actual nature of mind, yeah. you could say. So it, it's interesting to see if that movement can make <clears throat> the next step. Um, obviously, as I said before, it's much better than acting out. To be aware that right, you're yeah, angry yes, yeah. is a lot mm -hmm. better than... Maybe you than, wouldn't tweet quite as fast back to... Um, yeah. Or use quite as many cruise missiles. When, maybe. Maybe you'd actually have a moment of <laughs> right. contemplation. Or wouldn't that do be I nice? Have, do I have to follow that thought? Is that thought really worth following? <laughs> <laughs> you know, again, in the Zen tradition, you've had, you got um, blessed by the um, beats picking up... Uh, Indeed, we did. You, picking up the beach, you could say. Of course, uh, Kerouac's famous book, uh, Dharma Bombs. And, but Gary Snyder, going back to the things of what, what our culture is going to bring to Buddhism, yes. is, uh, uh, I think Gary Snyder had a quote where um, uh, social activism, the, the, the caring of other people that's so beautifully stated and, and moved on in Christianity is something that the Buddhism is now just kind of waking up to called engaged Buddhism. So I, I'm going to ask you about that because that seems to be something that is a, a, a real upside to lay Buddhism now. Indeed. Or, yeah. So go ahead, talk about social yeah, activism. Some people say it's, a, it's an oxymoron. Oh yeah, um, engaged Buddhism. That, that <laughs> Buddhism, by its yeah. nature, is engaged. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. And again, this is um, as we move away from the turning within, from the idea that that my mind is inside of me, to uh, this the realization that this table is mind, mm -hmm. that you are mind, mm -hmm. I am mind. Um, it's not something within. The bombs are falling. Our mind. our mind, right. um, the the gas in the in Syria in, and in all of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that <clears throat> too uh, merits our attention. That too is our life and is what we need to attend to. Yeah. Um, obviously, it can be overwhelming, and um, particularly uh, if you, if the way you take it in is through the TV or some screen or some news media. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the point is not to, to put your head in the sand, but somehow to open up and include in your practice, in mm -hmm. your quest mm -hmm. for liberation, everything that's around you. Um, My name is Calvin Griffin, host of Military in Hawaii, which airs here on Think Tech Hawaii every Friday at 11 a.m. Please join us. We'll be talking about issues concerning our military, veterans community, and other related issues that concern all of us. 
Aloha, this is your host Beatrice Cantelmo. Uh, come and join us every Friday at 4 o'clock uh, on Perspectives of Global Justice. Hi, I'm Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist in Hawaii, and I do a show called Shrink Wrap Hawaii, where shrinks and sometimes other people come on and talk about the art and science of psychology, talking to people, relationships. Uh, so if you are curious about shrinks and want to be shrunk and don't know where to go, tune into Shrink Wrap Hawaii. All right? All right. I want to under, go back to a certain point, there, which is uh, the stress reduction, which is really how mindfulness, you could say, has been sold. And I don't mean to be callous about it. Again, we're both in agreement, man. Have some self-reflection, have some space between thought and reaction. We're good to go with this in terms of Buddhism entering the mainstream culture. Yes. Start to know your mind. Start to be brave enough to actually look at those thoughts. Good to go. Stress reduction, though. 300, they say the, the laws of productivity in our country, <laughs> leave it to us to figure this out. Right, this Three, would be the terms that we, yeah. we, we, we can about. understand. $300 billion loss in, in stress. And, and, and we, you and I could go on forever about this, especially if we start talking about iPhones and distraction and how people really just don't know how to be present at all. Much of, uh, at all. It's just like it's been robbed from them. They're, so, they're always ahead mm -hmm. of themselves. But stress reduction now is in 200 hospitals. We have two, two schools here doing empathy and compassion. It's in, it's in every level of schooling now, from grade school, preschool, high school. Uh, Pete Carroll, Seahawks, mindfulness. Uh, the, of course, uh, Philip, um, uh, the coach of the uh, Chicago Bulls. Right. Philip, uh, Phil um, Jackson. Yes. Famous for uh, practicing Zen. So let's talk about the upside again of the stress reduction part of how Buddhism is helping our culture. That was to you. It's to you now. <laughs> <laughs> it's to you, Michael. <laughs> well, I think you've, you've, you've named a, a lot of ways in which it's doing that. Mm -hmm. um, to what end, we oh. might ask? Uh, and your, uh, your introduction in terms of uh, loss of productivity, mm -hmm. I think, is revealing of, of part of the motivation for doing it. Mm -hmm. um, at least by uh, you know various corporations mm -hmm, and things that mm -hmm, are mm -hmm. are interested in those things and, right, and must right. be and need to be right um, I like to th think that um, there's something important to recognize in uh, in the fact that so many people are stressed out and anxious that basically our situation our our way of living is becoming more and more untenable Unten yeah. Mm -hmm. Damn right I'm anxious. Yeah. I'm hanging by a thread. It, it, um, amazing, is, that, yeah. is that something to just kind of quiet down and mm -hmm. look away from? Or is it something that could be a source? Right, right, of, right, right. Are you putting uh, a Band-Aid on with this one, or are you actually going to look at the problem, which yeah. is that uh, it's, the reason you're feeling crazy is because we're living crazy. I mean... Yeah, so I think mindfulness can help us look at that mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. take stock of that as mm -hmm. well. And that's important. Um, and again, it, it needs to go farther than just coping. Um, Beautifully said, farther yeah. than coping. Although, nothing wrong with coping. Nothing wrong with coping. Don't nothing, stop there. Nothing wrong with having <laughs> a few moments of self-reflection so that there's a space, as uh, Steve Covey said, the millisecond that changes the world, world because it's the, the difference between reaction, you, you, yes. have a, you have a second to actually say how you're going to act versus just react. Yes. That's a pretty profound second. Indeed. To, to do, yeah, it really. Um, one of the things I'm, I'm, I want to tee you up for is that we, <laughs> we talk about, is, is Buddhism a religion? Mm. Well, Buddhism is many things. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Make me one with everything. <laughs> that one? Uh, that's a good one, but... Um, <laughs> The pizza it's joke. a bit like, um, <laughs> you know, my brother and I have the same mother, mm -hmm. but we're not the same people. Mm -hmm. And uh, all the many forms of Buddhism have the same origin, but they've branched out in very different ways. Mm -hmm. Some are more religious in orientation. Some are less so. Mm -hmm. that, and, and I think one of the hallmarks of, of religion, as it's generally thought of in practice, is belief. 
belief in a creed, belief in a certain history. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, a lot of Buddhism doesn't have that. Uh, and Zen certainly is not, that's not an important part of it. Mm -hmm. the, the thing that's at the core of it is, mm -hmm. is this right now. Who is hearing these words? That's what we need to investigate. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, we have to get our beliefs out of the way. Mm -hmm. and all the concepts and ideas that we've filled ourselves with and misidentified with over years and, and thousands of years, really, as a people. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a different kind of inquiry. And uh, I would say that that still is fundamentally religious. Uh, we could disagree about whether that mm -hmm. word applies or mm -hmm. not. But I think where it does apply is in that we're talking about the unknown yes and we're moving mm -hmm. into the unknown mm -hmm. so in some in some religious teachings they want to take that unknown and put beliefs in there for you something mm -hmm. for us to hold on to mm -hmm. and believe in so mm -hmm. that we can um, move forward in life and have positive values and, and believe that that's going to work out mm -hmm. uh, Zen takes that away pretty much and uh, says but still, you need enough belief, enough trust in the teaching and in the practice itself to try it. To do the practice. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there has to be, like, you believe that your teeth are going to be better off by cleaning them. You do have to believe that your mind's going to be better off if you sit by yourself and actually uh, get to know your own head space a yes. little better. I mean, you have to have that trust. To get started. Yeah. And then somebody says, by the way, this happens, and then that happens, you get excited, you get, you get turned down, you go, well, they might be something to actually learning how to uh, sit in silence, sit, yes. sit in presence. So let's go to yet another kind of exciting uh, direction that has gone with. I think Einstein said, um, if there's any religion that could cope with modern scientific needs, it would be Buddhism. And your own teacher, Aiken Roshi, has a famous quote, uh, the practice isn't to clear up the mystery, but to make the mystery clear. Yes. What, what, what is this uh, almost uh, darling quality of Buddhism for uh, quantum physics people? And, I, I uh, think it's physics. because it's empirical. It's empirical, it, Because yeah. it's yeah. based yeah. on experience. It's based on experience. Beautifully yeah. said, yeah. Uh, right. You don't have to believe anything, but you have to have that willingness to do it. But then the experience... And let's is, see what happens. Let's see what let's, happens. Let's, right. let's, let's check it out closely. Yeah. yeah. Um, where it differs, I think, is, is in a couple of areas. Um, one of the things that uh, we don't do in, in Buddhist practice is form a hypothesis. Um, at least in Zen, that's not going to help you. And then test the hypothesis. You have to remain open to what shows itself. Mm -hmm. And that, that becomes quite a challenge for us. Uh, in, in science, in scientific method, you have a hypothesis and then you test that. Mm -hmm. But I think we've, we come to understand in Buddhism that just having a hypothesis already influences your experience. And I, it's really part of the discipline of science to try to not let that happen, to try to be open one way or another, but you've still created a kind of framework of does support the hypothesis or does not. And things beyond that framework are hard to take in as significant. Because okay. you've limited the framework. Yes. Yeah. And one of your ways of checks and balances, or one of your ways of saying, we've got a hypothesis. In some ways, your hypothesis, or one of the tools that you've used in Zen practice is koan. The koan practice is a hypothesis in some ways. Figure this piece out. And particularly, you just finished your spring session. Yes. Session. So again, take us now inside that moment where a cone is being presented, this kind of paradoxical question, of, of which I'd love if you would share one. And then there's this dokusan, I believe it's called, this very intense interview, a lot more formal than this. There's lots of bells going off and lots of bowing, <laughs> right? Take us inside that a little bit, because the cone seems to be part of the proof or part of the hypothesis that the science of Buddhism uh, speaks about. Yeah, the, the experience. Interesting. We're talking about experience. Now, yes, right? yes. The, the koans are really matters of, of the fundamental nature of our life laid open for us to see clearly. The, the Chinese means simply public case. It's, it's completely open. There it is. Um, it's a misnomer that these are devices to tie up our intellectual mind. Mm -hmm. the, the truth is that we can't 
we can't see them intellectually, we have to see them directly. Uh, and it's not that there isn't some intellect involved, but experience has to be primary. Mm -hmm. uh, conceptual understanding can come out of that, but the, the matter opened up in the koan is, needs to be experienced directly. So, um, A vividness. A vividness of awake. We, yeah, we could call it a uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, right. I'm not, I'm going to try not to describe it, okay. but to leave it at that. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, a, 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 many koans in Zen uh, begin with the question, why did Bodhidharma come from the West? Bodhidharma was the purported and semi-legendary founder of the oh. Zen tradition. Uh -huh. And we find out that uh, tea came from him and Kung Fu and all these various things. But uh -huh. um, anyway, um, the question means that Buddhism had been in China for three or four hundred years already. The practices of Buddhism, the teachings, the sutras. Mm -hmm. But what about the Buddha's realization? What about that? What happened when the Buddha looked up and saw the morning star? Mm -hmm. That's the question at the heart of why Bodhidharma came from the West. Ah, to bring that to... Said. Uh, that's fun. Thank you. So, um, a monk once asked the Master Jiaozhou about that. Yes. And he said, the oak tree, or really the cypress tree, in the courtyard. End of story. End of story. Yeah. So it's up to each of us to, mm -hmm. to understand, realize the, the, the truth of that. Mm -hmm. Right now. Right here. Yeah. Right now. If we turn it into a principle, mm -hmm. well, everything then is the reason. No, that's no, not it. No. It's can, not everything. It's not the intellectual. Everything is, is an idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beautifully said. There's so much to talk about. I want to talk about aesthetics and wabasabi <laughs> and so much, but I'm afraid that we've, at least for this go around, okay. we've, run, we've run out of time. But I, I think we've sure. thrown out a few interesting concepts, and I want to thank you so much again. My sign off is always the same it's be kind, be courageous, do some good, and have some fun. Thank you so much for tuning in, and uh, I look forward to seeing you again. Aloha. Aloha.